Thank you all. Turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. It's where we're going today. Is we're focusing in on the 10, the 10 words, the 10 commandments, how you want to have it. In Exodus, what was revealed to Moses. And man, uh, it's what a thing to look at. And what a weighty thing to look at. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this commandment in uh, in particular, in about a month, I'm about to have a little baby girl. I'm so pumped about it. And Devin is, is man, she's been, she's been so great and we're excited. And I want to say that you all have been so good to us and really want to say that. But the reason I bring this up and why it relates to this is because it's so interesting to name a child. Like, that's a big deal. Don't mess it up, all right? They're going to have it their whole life, so don't blow it. And you better pay attention to what the names are when you start putting that monogram together, ladies, because you, you want that looking good and you don't want the initials turning out something else than you thought. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of weight to a name, not only about that in that process, but a name in general. If we think of names of individuals, if we think of names of organizations, I looked in 2014, Coca-Cola spent $3.5 billion on branding, on marketing, on their name. Why? So you go buy Coke Zero or whatever it's called now. They changed it and apparently it's no good. I don't know. But not the point. The name is important. If I say names of individuals, lots of things come to your mind. If I say Adolf Hitler, a lot of emotions come to mind. If I say Osama Bin Laden, you think of places, of people, of organizations, of periods of history, of events that happen. Or on the other hand, if I say someone like Billy Graham, or if I say Harriet Tubman, all flooding into our mind is a range and spectrum of emotions. And so these are so important, a name, because they're so closely connected to our identity, though they are separate. But see, when it comes to God, it's altogether different. Because the name of God is not like our name, as we're going to see, is that the name of God is the very descriptor of his essence, of who he is. And the name is weighty. And as we approach this commandment, it has to do with the name and the weight and the glory in his identity as God. And so let's go ahead and stand as we look at Exodus chapter 20. Today we get in the third commandment. I want to start by reading verses 1 and 2 again because verses 1 and 2 provide the foundation for understanding the commandments. Verse 1. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then looking at verse seven, we see the third command. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, let your name be hallowed. God, would you not let me talk about you in any way that is not worthy of who you are, of your person? We are thankful to know you and thankful for your redemption that has been accomplished by your name. I pray for the next 30 minutes or so, God, you would open our hearts, reveal us, reveal yourself to us and reveal our hearts before our own minds. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. So before starting this, I'm gonna tell you what, I've, I've really been wrestling because when it comes to preaching in the 10 commandments, I think this is a really weighty matter. And the reason why is because our natural bent and inclination is to try to earn the favor of God by obeying him, okay? So I want you to hear me really clearly this morning. We wanna emphasize this every week. That is our natural bent. We wanna try and earn the favor of God, but even as we look in verses one and two, that's not how favor was given to Israel. God gave them favor in his grace, delivering them out of Egypt, and then gave him the Torah, the instructions, the 10 commandments, as we call them not to constrain them, but to liberate them and to know what it looks like to receive fatherly instruction from God. And so know this, if you leave today, 
Don't want you leaving thinking, hey, I just wanna try to obey a command because I'm gonna try to be a better person. That's just missed the point. Our response to God in the commandments, I think, is threefold. We could put it many ways, but I think, number one, the commandments reveal the character of God, which is an awesome thing. A.W. Tozer says, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Number two, they reveal about us our hearts. And with that, it reveals our need for a savior. And so I wanna make that very clear. The command should push us and drive us into an understanding of our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we look at this command, the first thing I wanna do is I want to talk about the name of the Lord. We're gonna talk about this command in three sections today. We're gonna talk about the name of the Lord. We're gonna talk about the command of the Lord. And then it's gonna be great because we talk about Jesus the Lord. And so as we're thinking about the name, the reason this is so significant is you can't understand the command outside of the name. And so if you have your Bible and you wanna turn over to Exodus chapter three, I wanna read where I think we see one of the most greatest demonstrations of the name, of God explaining what it is. And so in Exodus three, Moses has left Egypt. He's out in the wilderness of Midian. He's shepherding his flock. And out of nowhere, he sees this burning bush, if you remember the story. This bush is being burnt, but it's not being consumed. And so like any rational person, Moses goes, checks it out. So he's checking it out. The Lord begins to speak to him. And the Lord begins to tell him, I have heard the cries of my people Israel, and I'm gonna use you as my representative to go deliver Israel from the slavery of Egypt. And so Moses has a question, I think relevant. He asks, basically, who are you? Look at this in chapter three, verse 13. Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So really what we need to understand, I think primarily, is in light of Moses' upbringing in Egypt, he has in his mind a whole pantheon of gods when he's asking what the name of God is. And probably behind his question of what is your name is who are you? What cultic or tribal affiliation do you have? What is your power limited to? What geographic region are you associated with? This person claiming to be God to me. God says, really, all the wrong kind of questions. He simply says, I am who I am. And in verses 14 and 15, if I put this slide up, hopefully we can see uh, clearly, is that three times in these two verses is the same root word in Hebrew used by God to describe himself. And it's a verb that means to be. God's simply saying he has being. He's saying, I am who I am. Then he says, I am has sent you. And then he says, the Lord. He says, the Lord. And that's probably in in your Bible in all caps in most translations that you have. But here's what you need to know. I've got another slide up here to explain this. When you see Lord in all caps, that doesn't mean when you're reading it, you need to yell for emphasis. All right, what's behind that in the translation in the Hebrew is what's called the divine name. What It's likely pronounced Yahweh, yet we're completely unsure, but that's not the point. The point is, it's from the same root word, holding that same connotation of I am. It's a referent for Moses to refer to God, but notice he doesn't just say the Lord or literally Yahweh right there. He says, my name is Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So why are we spending so much time talking about the name? Because God, in his name, is revealing a lot about himself, all right? Identity-wise, by saying I am who I am, he's saying I have absolute existence. I am self-existent. He is a completely non-contingent being. He's not contingent upon anyone else, any other force, any other thing. He has all power, omnipotence within himself so that when he created the world and spread that power, he had no less power than when he began. Think on that. He is eternal. He is holy, as we've seen. As Moses is approaching him, he's told him to remove his shoes. This place you're standing is holy ground. So he's all these things. He's not like other gods. Why? Because he's authoritative. Basically, his name isn't really a name at all. It's really a descriptor. 
You can't name God because when you name something, you invoke authority over it. When you name a dog, when you name a child, you have authority. It's why you're able, guys. You can't name me. I simply am. And he is all authoritative. And by his authority, everyone's heart is pounding in your chest right now. But not only that, not only is God transcendent and holy, meaning he's so far separated from us, he's much more than that. You see, it's not good enough to talk about the God of Israel, Yahweh, is simply a first push, a first mover, a first cause. That in itself is blasphemy to God because it's not enough about him because he's not simply a first cause. He is a God who has eternally bound himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning he's not just a God of transcendence. He's a God of eminence, meaning he is with us. He is a God of relationship. And man, this is an awesome thing. And so all these things about God, knowing the significance of what his name is indicating to us, let's read this command again. Verse seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord. Who is that? What Lord? Is it any Lord? No, it's not any Lord. It's not any God. It's not some obscure reference to any God or a higher power. You shall not take the name of Yahweh, the great I am, in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So you feel there's a lot more significance because this is really personal. This is the name of God. This is base level information when you know someone is knowing their name. I forgot a couple people's name this morning. Failure, <laughs> right? But this is God. We're speaking of his name. <clears throat> and so as we're thinking about the command. We've looked at the name. Now I want to look at the command of the Lord and what all this entails. And first you need to know if this is helpful to you, good. If not, it's okay. I think our English translations are really good and spot on and encapsulating the meaning. But literally there's this idea of you should not lift up or you should not carry the name of Yahweh for a worthless reason or for emptiness or for vanity, for not the weight it deserves. So what does this reveal about the character of God? It reveals about the character of God that he is weighty and he is worthy and he is glorious. So to talk about him or use him or any way in something that is less than that is vanity, is worthlessness. So as we're thinking about the command, here's a few things I wanna see. Number one, I wanna look at how we break it, okay? And you're gonna see this far extends past, oh my God. Definitely includes it, but far extends it. We're gonna see how we break it. And then I wanna look at what this reveals about the human heart. And again, we do not try to obey these things to gain the favor of God. I wanna make this very clear. But at the same time, we need to feel, I think, the teeth of the Lord's commandments and what they reveal about our hearts and our inability before the Lord. And so as we're thinking about the command and how we break it, what I wanna tell you today is it is really broad how you can break this thing, how we have already broken it. I, I think a lot of people try to nail down one thing, try to tie in ancient Near Eastern culture. I think that's missing the point of how the commandments are laid out in the first place. Each commandment is laid out in a very broad manner, which can encompass a range of things within it because it's the foundation of the Torah. It's the foundation of the law. But here, I've tried to split into five categories. If you feel like I left something out, you're probably right. But here are five that have stuck out to me. Number one, when we swear on God's name. Now, I think this is closely tied to the context, the historical context of taking formal oaths, invoking the name of Yahweh. Though today, that doesn't apply to us as much. But I think this could apply when you're trying to defend yourself. And I... I swear to God, I, I swear by, by God. Or maybe you say, by God, I this. I swear to Jesus, or even I swear on the Bible. And you say, wait a minute, none of those included the word Yahweh. That's his name, right? But that's missing the point. The name, we're talking about the referent of Yahweh God of Israel. And we all know who our referent is. It's the God of the Bible. And his word is so attached to his person that to take his word for vanity is to take his name in vanity. So if we were to swear to God, well, what are we trying to do when we, we swear to God? We're trying to give ourselves more credibility when we only have his credibility as much as we have in ourselves and what our word means. That's why Jesus said, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Number two, 
Another way I think we can, when we use God's name in attempts to manipulate his power or his presence. This would, I think, been very common during Moses' day. You would try to know the name of God and you would bring it under your power. You would make an image out of it like we talked about last week and you would bring that idol, that name under your power and invoke it for power. You think that's the way to treat Yahweh, God of Israel? No way. Uh, This is the kind of idea in Acts when the sons of Sceva start invoking the name of Jesus to cast out demons, though they don't worship Jesus. And you know what happened to those guys? They left naked and afraid. You know what I'm saying? Those guys, those demons tore them apart. They're trying to invoke it for their own selfish gain, and we could do the same thing, I think, very easily. Maybe that's we're trying to pray and invoke Jesus' name to get something we want or to give ourselves credibility, maybe to put it on a business card or to put a verse on a business card or the name of Jesus trying to say, man, God will bless my business if I do this. Now, there's a right way to do those things. I'm not condemning putting a verse on your your business card, not saying that, but it depends. What is the heart intent behind these things? What are we trying to do? Another way, I think we try to manipulate God's power and presence when we do things like, God led, led me to do fill in the blank. Now, not that God can't lead us to do something. We've got to be very careful. Anybody ever heard, I think God is leading me to divorce my wife. That would be, man, to take the Lord's name in vain. That moves, that goes against his word. Number three, <clears throat> when we use the name irreverently or abusively. And so I think this is when probably things are gonna start getting a little more convicting because this is gonna hit a little more close to home. So what, what do I mean by this? I think this is exclaiming, oh my God, Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, using those names, even when I'm saying it right now, it makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? But saying those things in a way to express extreme dissatisfaction or extreme pleasure, or extreme excitement, and invoking the name to add to what you're trying to communicate to those around you. When that's not why we use the Lord's name. The Lord's name is for worship. It's the worship of his person, not for our own linguistics of how we want to show excitement. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody stump their toe and say, Muhammad? Like, nobody's saying that. I heard a pastor one time say, you don't everybody, don't see anybody ever saying, chubby Buddha. <laughs> you know, that it doesn't happen. Why? Because there are no power in those names. There's nothing about those names that hold weight. But the name of the Lord, Jesus, man, that's gonna hold some weight. But how dare we invoke it for the wrong reasons? I think I did this, this past, I don't think, I know I did this this last weekend when uh, my, my dad, I'd, I was out of town last weekend and my dad was telling me, hey, we're going to your, your granddad's and we're gonna go eat some steak. He's grilling steak. And I'm just gonna tell you what, my grandfather can grill some straight steak. He can do it in straight fire. I'm talking, it's good, okay? And well, I got excited and I was like, praise the Lord. And then I just, my heart dropped in my stomach because I'm thinking, I'm not praising the Lord I'm not praising the Lord right now. I mean, we could rightfully rejoice about food, but in the moment, I wasn't. So you see how your heart is so wrapped up in this. We don't use this irreverently like I did. I was telling my dad, I was like, dad, I'm sorry. Like that was, that was not for the praise of the Lord. How else? I've got one. I think it's gonna be convicting. I know it is for me. Singing in corporate worship without the heart intent of worship. And this is what's going on in, I believe, Isaiah chapter one, Amos chapter five, when God says, take away from me the noise of your songs. Just don't even show up if this is what's gonna be the state of your heart. We could pray irreverently. I remember I used to be, when I, was in, when I was in high school and we'd run out on the field, we'd run out on number one on the field to pray in front of everyone in the stands so everyone would know who the godly team was. You know what I'm saying? We'd huddle up on the field, we're all praying and the prayer went like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And it was like the most disgraceful thing to the name of the Lord ever and I took part in it. God should have struck me for that kind of attitude towards him. But and I, I'm guilty. I'm telling you what, I've been thinking about this text for two and a half weeks and it felt about an inch tall 
Like Isaiah 40, God says we're less than dust on the scales, and that's exactly what we are before his holiness. Number four, when we profess God's name and do not live answerably to it. <clears throat> so this extends past speech. What could this include? This could include doing good works on false pretenses, doing them for the wrong reasons, doing what Jesus said, praying in order to be seen by others, giving in order to be seen by others when in all your heart you're trying to just prop yourself up in your righteousness. This could apply all the way into hypocrisy. Amazing how far this commandment could extend into our lives. Hypocrisy is taking the Lord's name in vain. Why? It's because we are carrying his name in our confession and through our lives practically disowning the name. It's what the great Puritan Thomas Watson said. It's the type of behavior that has God in the mouth but the devil in the heart. Hypocrisy. Now, I'm a, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to live like a demon. When we take the Lord's name, we do not carry it with the weight it deserves. I've got another one. I believe this ties in as an application to not practice evangelism is to carry the Lord's name in vain. Why? It's because we're theologically proclaiming its saving power, and then we're practically holding it in contempt and treating it as if it's worthless by not proclaiming his name. Number five, last one, when we profane and abuse his word. I mentioned something about the word. I think this could be done in, a little, in many ways. You know how bad it frustrates you when somebody says something you didn't say or misrepresents or twists something that you said. How much more does a holy God have fury over that, over a prosperity gospel, for instance? So as we look at this, again, I want to bring us back in remembrance of something. Everybody in here is guilty. I'll tell you what, reading this commandment, it will literally break you in half to read this thing. The meaning is clear <clears throat> that at the end of this verse, the Lord will not hold him guiltless. What is it saying? The idea of this is, you and I aren't going to be let off the hook. It's not like God's gonna take a blind eye to this. If he's like, oh, <clears throat> you know what? It's all right, don't worry about it. Everybody does it. Everybody messes up on it. That's not the attitude of this text. The attitude of this text is perfection is demanded and required <clears throat> and we fall short. And so what does this reveal about our hearts? Here's what I wrote. Is sinful humans, all of us, we are born unable to comprehend the name of the Lord and to treat the Lord in a manner that gives the rightful glory, reverence, and respect due to his name. I think that's what it reveals about our hearts. And it's not okay. I don't want to make us think it's okay, but I do want to bring in hope. And that's what we look to. We look to the hope and the grace that God makes available to us, even in our failure in this command. This isn't about trying harder. It's about looking at the grace of God as a believer, man, and rejoicing. And it turning us to all, to, to, together to all, to something much different than just simply not transgressing the negative of this command. So let's look at Jesus the Lord. Why? Is Jesus so significant in relation to the name? What, how does he tie into this? So I think this is incredibly important. When you say the name in our culture, who do people say Jesus is? People say Jesus is a great philosopher. People say Jesus is, man, he was a social justice hero, real cultural warrior, guy to look up to. Man, if I could just base my morals on Jesus, he's awesome. Look how selfless he is. And you know what? All those things are true about Jesus. But if we leave the name of Jesus right there, I'm just gonna be honest with you, that's doo-doo. And I don't know any other kind of description for to blaspheme who he is, to understand the weight. So who does Jesus say he is? Because it really doesn't matter what men say about him and what he says about himself. And so I wanna look at John chapter eight. John chapter eight, I believe this is the most relevant text to what we've talked about as we've looked at the great I am, Yahweh, God of Israel, I am who I am. With John chapter eight, before we read this text up here, Jesus is in a dispute with the Pharisees and the Pharisees are claiming to be children of Abraham. All right, so 
By means of claiming to be children of Abraham, who are they claiming to worship? Yahweh. Jesus says, no, you're not. They say, yes, we are. No, you're not. It's like a tennis match back and forth in John 8. And through most of the rest of the Gospel of John, it's this way. And finally, Jesus says this. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Listen to Jesus' response. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. How many times have you heard Jesus never claimed to be God? Why are they wanting to stone him? Because they know exactly what he's, cla- he's, he's claiming. And why is Jesus so certain, certain and so emphatic that they are rejecting Yahweh God of Israel? It's because he's saying, I'm standing right here and you're rejecting me. We see God at the same time. Jesus comes as God in the flesh, yet he's praying to his Father. We see God as Trinitarian, Father, Son, Holy Spirit as one God. And to not understand him that way is to not know him. And it's to reject him, to blaspheme him, to curse him. This is where every cult group breaks down. Every cult offshoot of Christianity breaks down, most typically at the deity of Christ. A rejection of him. Oh, that he's just Michael the archangel. Oh, he's just the created son. No. Jesus says, I am. And there's a reason why there's seven I am statements in the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. life. Why? Because he's representing and embodying the fullness of deity bodily. Colossians 1. Hebrews 1. Philippians 2. All of these passages, John chapter one, wrapped up in his person. So why is this such good news? Okay, I wanna read Isaiah 43, verse 11 to you. And this is why this is such good news. So this is before the birth of Jesus. Yahweh, God of Israel says this, I, I am Yahweh, right there. I am the Lord and besides me, there is no savior. No one can save but God. But why then is Jesus' title Lord and Savior throughout the entire New Testament? What does that communicate to us about him? The reason it's so important that Jesus is the fullness of deity bodily, it's because only God can save. It's only God can save. And that's why Peter says this of Jesus in Acts 4.12 regarding his name. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other what? Name under heaven, given among men, by, we, by which we must be saved. So it's essential that Jesus is the fullness of God. He is Emmanuel, as Isaiah prophesied in chapter seven, verse 14. That is essential, but it's also essential that he is fully man. He embodies both, and this is a concept we will never grasp in our finite minds But Jesus is fully man. Why is this so important? Because we know this. We've been talking about it. Jesus is the only law fulfiller. He is the only 10 commandment fulfiller. He is the only one who has kept this third commandment about his father in heaven with perfection. So what does this mean? Why is this so central as we look at the law and look at Jesus and what has he done for us as fully God, fully man, that he is in his life fulfilled with perfection, the law. He said, I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law, Matthew 5, 17. And then in his innocence, in his holiness, goes to the cross and takes on the punishment of our sin takes on the punishment for our transgression, our stepping over the boundary of these commandments. And that is such wonderful news. And this is the news of the gospel, right? This is the good news is that Jesus has taken the punishment for what we deserve because of our disobedience to law, but not just that. He's done way more than that. Because this is what's true about Jesus in relation to law. I said at the beginning, 
There is no way that anyone can earn the favor of God through obedience to the commandments. There's no chance. We're all falling short of that. That's not the intent. The intent is that we love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what does that mean to do? To put faith in Christ. Because what happens when you put faith in Jesus, when you confess belief in him and believe in him, he gives you grace for your disobedience because he's taken punishment. But even more than that, I wrote it like this because I want to say things, I'd like to say these things exactly. When a person believes in Jesus, not only is the wrath of God satisfied through him dying on the cross, but when a person puts their faith in Christ, they abide in his fulfillment of the law itself. They are united with him in his perfect record. And he imputes or he gives or he places upon them his perfection as if they lived it themselves. That is the beauty of who Jesus is. They call it the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. It's alien. It's not our own. It's not something that we have in ourselves. It's Jesus giving it to us, giving us his perfect obedience to the third commandment. And so what is the result of this? What is the result? Because the point is faith in Jesus Christ, because that's how we are forgiven. That's how we have grace. But obviously there is wisdom in this command because Jesus sees it. And he says it in Matthew chapter six. What does he say? Don't pray like the Gentiles who heap up empty phrases thinking they will be heard for their many words. I want you to pray when you pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And notice that we're not calling God Yahweh. We're calling him Father. Why? Because we've been adopted as children. And he loves us. He longs for us to glorify his name because he loves us because he wants the best for our lives, though sometimes we can't see it in circumstances, but he's our father. He's our father, a gracious father. Not only that, Jesus here, he's not making a statement. He's making a petition. He's saying, God, let your name, Father, let your name be hallowed. And this is our prayer. It's not that when we look at the third commandment, oh, we just gotta do a better job at obeying. No, 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 we see Forgiveness is found in Jesus, so we put our trust in him, but it brings us to hallow the name of the Lord, not just to obey the negative, to not try to break it, but to take it into the positive that's implied. It's that we don't take his name in vain. We bring all glory and honor and reverence to his name, and we carry the name of the Lord with weight, with weight before others. So what does this mean? I think we howl the name when we believe in God. When we put our faith in him, his name is glorified. When we fear him, his name is hallowed because we're seeing him for who he is. When we model it before our coworkers, when we model it before our families and our families see, wow, look at the way they look at God. Look at it. That is, a, that is not like Christianity I've ever seen. They so, in a way, there's a weight to this, the way that they treat the name of the Lord. I think we see it when we keep Jesus' commands. The name of the Lord is hallowed. In all things, we could go on and on. Paul said, in all things, in word or deed, whatever you do, do it to the glory of his name. And so as we're thinking about this as believers, we do need to feel the teeth of the commandment, and, but that should draw us into the grace of Christ and draw us in that we want to hallow the name out of love and a desire for God, not because we wanna keep a commandment. It would be to miss the point. But I also wanna say this morning that you may not have a relationship with Christ. And as we look at the 10 commandments, you need to know this. If you have not put your faith in Jesus, you are obligated to keep the whole law. You are obligated to keep every ounce of the law with perfection or else you will perish. And that is the reality. And the reason we preach is because we don't desire that for anyone. God desires grace and to mercy. It's why he sent his son but need to know this today. If that's where you are, 
And God extends grace through what Jesus has done. You need only to trust in him. It's by grace that we're saved through faith. You trust in him, put your trust in him, believe in him, and evidence that trust by being baptized. And so as our musicians come up this morning, I pray as we're thinking about this commandment that it takes you into a different kind of thanksgiving as to the identity of the Lord. But I wanna tell you this morning, there are lost souls in this room and the Lord will not hold you guiltless for taking his name in vain unless you are put, to, you put your trust in Christ. There is no greater thing than to be able to know the name of God, to call him Father, and to glorify him through obedience and through embodying him in the way that we are ambassadors, as we're gonna celebrate here in a few moments, to the nations as we send off some through the way we represent his name. So let's pray together.